Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering five conversations from episode 20, our discussion with Donna Cryer about the challenges for patient advocates and, for that matter, all key stakeholders as the issues become more urgent, complex, and practical. Plus, from the vault, conversation 46.5 from season three, the wrap-up conversation from last summer's NAFLD Summit coverage. This conversation starts with me introducing the session in the context of earlier discussions on the prospective role of patients in key Nash decisions and how this role seems to have evolved over time. From there, Donna Cryer starts with a discussion about her view of the role of patients and advocates in these various processes. It starts with her telling a story about a corporate client setting her advisory work as a patient advocate at a lower hourly billing rate than she had carried when she served as a member of a PR firm or an independent consultant. This led her to note that in this formula, being a patient somehow reduced the value of her contribution. She goes on to discuss some of her issues with ICER, which she states with a finer point than we did last week in episode 19, but not much, that she thought it was not a good exercise. From there, she goes on to the nomenclature discussion and her particular frustration that the strategic and quantitative impact assessment she said was promised to the patient community has not yet been done. One of her underlying thoughts is that the skills necessary to perform a task vary based on the task. It's kind of an obvious observation. And that she does not believe the proper skill sets have been brought to some of these tasks, notably, in this case, the impact assessment or the whole question of impact. The last two episodes of Surfing the Tsunami, episodes 19 and 20 in season four, have looked at patient and advocate reactions to two major events happening in fatty liver space today. Together, they paint a fairly complete picture of the excitements and frustrations the advocate community faces today. As I said last week, progress is a long journey, so let's all keep pushing. And while you do so, listen, sit back, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the discussion in our LinkedIn discussion group. Now, let's go back to the conversation. I set this up a little bit. I'll go a little further, okay? When we first started this podcast, the first time we had Donna on, we talked about the true meaning of patient empowerment. I then carried that thread forward to the following January. No, two Januaries, hence. When Michael Charlton asked the question, who is going to be the uh, Larry Kramer of Nash? I'm not sure Michael knew what he was asking at the time. I think Donna and I both have learned subsequently that different people might have interpreted that question in different ways that he meant it. But I think it's an important question because uh, what it alludes to is the idea that somebody has to be on the outside banging to get the patient voice heard. And how do you do that? We go from there a year forward to the round table at Nash uh, Tech 2022, where one of the FDA folks, I don't remember which one, said if I had known now and understood patients now the way I understood them Two years ago, some things might happen differently. I'm assuming that had to do with the OCA decision, although nobody said anything that specific. And now we come into a period when a lot of important decisions are being made. We have an ISA report on the value of Rosmeterom and OCA. We have nomenclature conference, and we have an upcoming OCA FDA ad comp just to show that everything that goes around comes around. Three circumstances where lots of stakeholders have points of view. Those points of view are not identical. And the question of who gets listened to and how loudly and what do we do about that becomes... I, I think really important. And the conclusion from the first two is that while we say we're all about the patients, when we get to these moments, it's not clear that we act like we are. Donna, did I say that nicely enough? Donna Cryer. You did. You said it so nicely that I don't dare open my mouth. Let's this completely go off the rails. I, I'm going to let you expound. And if you derail us, that's fine. Because I think at that point, the fact that I'm not a patient leads me to stop. Great television. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and let me add. <laughs> Jörn Schottenberg. Maybe, maybe this is a different perspective, a different thought. Um, and uh, as an individual that is sick, you're affected by a condition and you try to figure this out. So then there is a name put to that condition by most of the time your research on the internet or your physician. And to what extent does that name matter uh, versus uh, how do I feel and how am I affected? And maybe that, yeah, I I know you have thought about this a lot too, Donna. Uh, That's kind of a... You know, I I, I appreciate that too. So I, um, maybe I'll start this way. I was at uh, an industry partner's headquarters with about 40 of their lawyers, some from compliance, some from other areas of their legal team, at the behest of some of the R&D folks that I and some other patients had been working with for a while. And uh, I said to them, I know how much you paid for my advice when I was at a PR firm. Uh, I know how much I was, you know, billed out in that system. I know how much my advice was compensated when I was an independent consultant. And so we face a situation where it seems to me, based on what has been proposed, that you think that my advice is now worth only a fraction of what it was before. 
since now I am coming in through the door as a patient advocate. So basically you're saying that when you add all of my professional and academic uh, credentials, you subtract for my lived experience to come up with what you're deeming as my fair market value. And they sort of fell over themselves and said, no, 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 that's not what you're doing. That's what the math maths. So we started a better conversation about the work they do on differentiating between the consulting and advisory and the inputs that they get from the chief of gastroenterology at, at an institution to, I don't know, a medical student or, or someone else that they would and, uh, and how they have found a way to differentiate the, the value of that input. And so I say that to mean, uh, I use that, that story to mean that there's a discount that is placed on patient input. It's often glossed over. It may seem on its surface as if we're given a role, a seat at the table. But time and time again, that is just window dressing intentionally at its worst, at its most innocent. It's simply an inexperience of working with people with lived conditions and a lack of respect from that unfamiliarity and a marginalization that occurs. So ICER was not built for patients. It was not built for people. It was built for payers. We saw this particular review, and although their processes have changed a bit over the years because of the work of many patient advocates, including myself, but I give you know credit to, to so many more, and organizations like PIPSI and the Patient Partners to Improve Patient Care under former Congressman Tony Coelho, who helped write the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Institute for Value Innovation, of which I was on the founding board. So there have been many, many patient groups and many, many patients who've worked hard to get ICER to move the one inch so that there's just more window dressing. When it came to our review, it, it's an intentional misrepresentation of the disease, a mischaracterization of disease progression, of the role of fibrosis, of the role of placebo groups, of the realities of clinical practice. And it was, you know, a forced timing um, because otherwise you would wait for the data and you can't both say, oh, we don't have useful data, meaningful data to put into. So we have to make all these crazy, wild assumptions and then say, well, we can't give it a good grade because we don't have good data. That's just nonsense. So the whole ISO review was nonsense. And it was important to give to get the patient points and voice on the record. But the ISO review was nonsense and I, I really won't give it any more time. The nomenclature process has the possibilities of giving far more harm. And I think as I was trying to uh, think about how I would uh, be helpful to the next step of the process, that's the phrase that that occurred to me as perhaps persuasive to the well-intentioned members of the steering committee, that all of the doctors involved took a pledge to do no harm. They are going to violate that oath. And so what I'm asking for, what I've consistently asked for, and maybe I lacked clarity, although that's not something I'm usually accused of, I've asked for, many our advocates have asked for, and I was promised an impact report before a name change was rolled out, not while it was being rolled out, before. And an impact report would have people who have different skills than the academic medical doctors who have been steering the process. Those skills would be public relations, brand managers and change experts. They would be MBAs, masters of business administration, just in case people are still confused, people who use numbers so that there is an independence and a rigor and a quantification of the various things that will be involved and implicated in this change, how much damage will be done, what costs would be incurred in those in the process of those changes, and how we can mitigate any of those harms. That has not been done any proposition that it can be done in a grouping or a convening such as the liver forum, which again, lacks that different expertise that has been brought to the table, is non-responsive to the patient community request. I'll say that. FDA, FDA, God bless FDA. Um, it would have been fantastic if we had had the opportunity that we do intend to do at some time to do an FDA listing session um, across 
divisions so that they would understand. We would have an opportunity as a, as a larger community, scientific and patient and other, to really educate them on, on what is necessary across the device side, the cardiovascular, renal, the endocrine, oncology, as, as rare disease, as well as um, as well as our hepatology division, because we see uh, unnecessary adverse actions across the agency. I have it has not been demonstrated to to my satisfaction or or the patient community's satisfaction that any place in FDA understands how to evaluate a liver drug product device properly. And so that is the context in which we've come. And we've told them this. Now, do we have the money of Alzheimer's? No. But it doesn't mean that we're wrong. Um, and so uh, the, the unifying factor is um, a, a, a lack of understanding that what they are doing across entities has real world impact on real people that they should care about, but don't. It is not risky enough for them to make an adverse action in the liver community. And it will never be risky enough for them to make an action of the liver community until our community is larger and stronger and louder and scaled. And so the question I said in, you know, at NASHTAG still stands. Uh, maybe this is a question I only pose to the person speaking next to me at the regulatory panel, but what have you know, each of the anybody listening to to this podcast done to increase the visibility and viability of the patient advocacy community, so we can have the impact that we need on all of these entities. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. Next week, EASL Vice Secretary Alexander Krag and Education Counselor Sven Franke will be joining us to begin our preview of the 2023 EASL Congress. Should be fascinating. Should be fun. So until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.